Hey, thank you. Hey, we're sorry we're a little bit late today. We're having some technical issues. So we're waiting for the man of the hour, Captain Bill Gustin from uh, Miami-Dade uh, to, to join us. He's having some minor technical issues. We do have Dan Shaw with us. We, our, our good buddy, Mike Dugan, won't make it today. He's got a family emergency that he's tending to, taking care of some relatives. So Michael can't be here, um, but we're gonna have a great discussion nonetheless. So Dan and I thought we'd just visit together for a few minutes about the upcoming FDIC 2022, which we've got some ex really exciting news besides the fact that Dan is keynoting on Wednesday, which is probably the most exciting thing. Uh, they, Dan told me that we had to do two things. We had to build extra hotels for the <laughs> overflow and we had to widen the doors on the convention center so he could get his head through. I thought, gonna, no, just kidding, Dan. And my nose. <laughs> right, yeah, okay, right. So, but no, Dan is our keynote on Wednesday. So it's going to be really exciting. I'm really looking forward to that. But we did some other really cool stuff we can tell you about now. Um, we used to run a show called EMS Today. And what we did was we've combined that curricular or a lot of that curricular inside of FDIC. So now we're going to have a, a cadaver lab during the regular classroom sessions. You can go to cadaver lab. We've got about 30 or so, 35 EMS classes we're going to run that you can get CE credit for from CAPSI. So it can go towards your annual certification. Um, you know, if, you, if you've got to pick up some more EMS classes, we've got six workshops we're gonna be doing that are EMS based. And we've got five, five hot EMS classes, active shooter with treatment, a water rescue by a guy named Mike Hudson, who's just out of, the, out of this world. The guy's out of this world. He's a real water rescue guy. If you got to watch Shark Week this this uh, this year, uh, uh, you, you know Shark Week on Discovery, Dan. You know that that yeah, Shark course. Week every year. So the guys from Jackass participated this year, right? And messing with sharks. Now, now the guys from Jackass and sharks can't see anything <laughs> wrong. One of the guys actually gets bit. Hudson's the medic who dives in and rescues him. <laughs> this is a dude goes racing up on a jet ski, dives in and rescues this cat. I mean. You can Google it. It's a, you know, it's on, uh, it's on um, uh, useless tube. You can, yeah. you can see, you can see the, uh, you can see the video there on useless tube. So it's a, it, it's amazing stuff, right? So he, he's going to be doing that. We've got a moulage lab. We've got Holly coming in. She does this incredible moulage lab. We've got this incredible cl class uh, called, um, it's, it's an airway class, but it's a radical airway class, right? Like you got these four docs coming up and what they do is like um, resiliency training, for, for airway, high intensity airway training. So if you're a medic, you know, and you've had some of these really challenging, you know, airway uh, cases, they're gonna put you through some, and then they're gonna do these high-end simulations with you in participating and helping you, and then showing you how to work through it and some skills for coping with those situations. Just freaking amazing stuff. And then the American, um, I wanna get this right, they're, they're really great people, but it's the American, um, a pediatrics association is doing a, a certification class on pediatric emergencies, bringing in a bunch of docs, and that's a hands-on workshop as well. So it's really cool stuff. And then there's a thing called the Gems Games. So I'm gonna throw out a little competition here. So I got some buddies out there. A fellow named Ernie runs a little fire department in Indianapolis. Buddy of mine, Charles, has got San Antonio. Buddy of mine, Ben's got Orlando. Another buddy of mine is out there in your neck of the woods, uh, Fairfax. What the, what's that fella's name? John, I think it is. I think, he, uh, yeah. I think it might be John. Yeah. So, you know, they're always, and, and, and then my buddy, I got another buddy out in uh, Austin. I've got a buddy in Dallas. I've got a buddy in Phoenix. I got a buddy. They're always, they're always bragging about their jobs, about how good they are. Well, in the GEMS games, we can find out how good their EMS teams are. You put together a team, you can have six folks, but only four perform. You put together a team and they've got this big preliminary thing they do on Tuesday. They take, we're going to take off Wednesday, Thursday, let them go to classes. But Friday morning, we're doing it on the big stage. So you're going to have like 4,000 people in there watching these guys. It's, it's completely choreographed. So there's, they got this insane scenario that they're planning. It's filmed. It's up on the jumbotrons and the winner gets a, you know, the winners take home a trophy this first, second, third, but 
I don't know. Is Indianapolis the best? Is uh, is is Ludwig's guys out of Champaign, Illinois, worth a damn? Are Butler's people? Are Butler's people going to compete? Or is Butler going to like you know go? Oh no, you know we, we just talk big. I don't know. I, I, that's John style. I'm just saying. Uh, John, uh, just you asking. might lay down a gauntlet for him. He I'm might just asking. Might step up. I'm just. I'm not saying. I'm just asking. You know, Miami Dade. Where are they going to be? Are they going to be in this thing? And and uh, and uh, Bernanke down there. Ben, uh, ben uh, What do you do? Is Orlando going to come and play? Is Austin going to come? And play well, who's gonna show? I want to see who shows up. I know FDNY is coming, they're, they're bringing their A game. We got a bunch of teams are bringing their A game. I, I know, uh, I know Malone's guys are going to be there out of Indy. Uh, I'm assuming that Ludwig's not going to miss this opportunity to show off with his people. So the gauntlet's been thrown, folks. Uh, you know, who, who is going to step up and 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 compete? And it's it's so cool because you know, you sit there. And you got a you got a live studio audience, you know, and, and cameras, and so it's going to be really, really cool. And then all that, you know, everything we always do. Red under fire is going to be there. Dan's going to be keynoting, but they're going to be teaching. You know, twenty five to five. Doug Doug Mitchell will be speaking on Thursday with Frank Bescuso and Dave Page. So we've got we've got Mitchell, we've got Sean Halton on on Wednesday. We've got Bescuso, uh, Mitchell, and uh, Page on Thursday. Um, we got a fella, I don't know, it's kind of an unknown, but we thought we should recognize him getting lifetime achievement. He's not really that well known. Um, God, I'm trying to think of his name. Oh, John, John. Um, God, rhymes with Alka, maybe Salka. Salka, that's it. John Salka, oh. lifetime achievement, man. Big, oh, John, big Johnny Salka. Can you imagine, right? Yeah, Talk fantastic. about overdue, right? Big Johnny yeah. Salka. So he's going to... He's going to get the lifetime so that, you know, stop, drop, rock and roll, stair climb, 5K, fool's bash, union party, all of that's still happening. It's just going to be amazing. And so we're bringing it all together because all your, you know, Fairfax, uh, uh, all the jobs all do EMS. We're all doing EMS, but we've never really embraced it in a really meaningful way before. And now we are. We're bringing it all together. You know, it's not just... You know, it's not just something else we do. It's what we do. You know, we we do a yes. ton of it. We all know it. And and we ought to be we are damn good at it. And and we ought to be proud of that. And I'm, I'm damn proud of it. So we're bringing in some of the best instructors in the country. We even have a class called the Fair Care and Feeding of Your Medical Director. And we've got four medical directors that are going to be up there and they're going to be saying, you know, what what, what they need from us. And, and we can ask them, you know, how we can get you know more out of them, right? So it's going to be a, a cool kind of panel thing going on there. So and uh, and a bunch of great trauma classes, you know the usual stuff. We got the uh, man versus machine, tons of great extrication classes. We've got just some really wickedly cool stuff going on. The water rescue class that we're doing with this Hudson guy, we've never done that before. But when you think about it, you know everybody's doing water rescue. And yeah. this guy, this guy is the this guy's the jam when it comes to water rescue. He's he's like, you know, he's like top of the food chain. So it's gonna be fun. It's gonna be a great deal. And, and I think it's a, you know, I'm, I'm I'm real proud of what we're doing. It's gonna be an amazing show. It's gonna be an amazing show. So you ready, Dan? You ready to, to blow everybody's no, doors off? No, not really. But I'm immensely looking forward. And, and uh, you're very generous compliment of introducing me. Uh, no, it, it's a incredible honor, especially as I. You, know, you and I've talked, but also just going back and looking at all the previous uh, keynotes, that is quite the uh, pantheon of, of fire service luminaries uh, who've stood up on that stage. Uh, I'm like, wow, I, okay, that's a, that's a, <laughs> that's a big lift. <laughs> I, thought was, I thought it was more like a rogues gallery. <laughs> well, I, I wouldn't say, they're not here to defend themselves, so I'll be generous. <laughs> uh, so just some, some wonderful people. So I know uh, Bill wanted us to talk a bit about leadership, which, you know, it's, it's a, it's a fascinating topic. As a matter of fact, I've got an editorial uh, coming out, I think in January about that very thing, because it's um, this year at FDIC, it was like the most submitted uh, proposal was to speak on leadership. And I, and I, and I, I pondered about it because of that. And I thought, you know, why, are, why, why, why so many people were interested in it. And, and in fact, it's the most widely written about, most widely, uh, most widely published topic in the world: leadership. I mean, you know, it's a, and whether you go to the Epic of Gilgamesh, 
or you go to Beowulf or, or any of the ancients, you know, Iliad, the Odyssey, they're all about leadership, period. You know, they're yeah. all about leadership. The, the, obviously, the Epic of, Gilga, Epic of Gilgamesh is just, that's all it's about, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and so it, it's, it's a fascinating topic that I think has really captivated our imagination since time immortal and, and, and with, with, good, with good meaning, too. I mean, I think that we're all, we're all looking for structure. And, and leadership is a, 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 a piece of structure, if, if you will. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, I think people forget that leadership can come in many ways. I think that leadership comes to us in some ways through um, kind of the, the guardrails that we learn about in life, whether it's our religious background, the Ten Commandments, um, you know, having having some there, there needs to be some boundaries or you don't have conscience. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like if you, if you don't if you don't have some things that guide you, I don't think you can be a leader. In other words, if you're totally nihilistic, that everything is just up to you. It, it, I think that's imp it's an impossible position to lead from, which is interesting because that was kind of where the Nazis came from. They were into existentialism and you had Martin Heidegger and people like that. And that's kind of their game plan. Which well, it, well. it comes down to values too, right? I mean, you, you talk about the Nazis and, and you know, one of the things we, you know, Doug and I will talk about in class and leadership when we get to that point is, you know, you kind of get this backstory of this, this uh, kid who grows up with an alcoholic father. He's not that great in school, so serves his country, doesn't do that great, but he has a resolve to keep at it and blah, 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 the rest of the story. And, you know, do you think he's a great leader? Yeah, that's a good leadership story. Well, that, that's Hitler. Yeah. He just had terrible integrity and moral and values. But I think, you know, to your point, a lot of people uh, may not know how to define leadership, but they know when they see bad leadership. And that's, and interesting I, too. That, that's a great point. It, we're all leaders to some extent. Yeah, the question, absolutely. The question you have to ask yourself, are, are you leading well or poorly? Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and, I, and I would think that in the fire service, by and large, most of the folks we know are leading well. They're doing yeah. a wonderful job. And, fact, and they're thirsty for more. That, that, that's the beauty of it. Is it's a nonstop process. I mean, I, I think you would agree. I mean, le leadership is immensely simple. It's the application that's really difficult. I mean, anyone can read a book and be like, "Yeah, I, I believe that." Now go do it. Go have that difficult conversation. Go make that uh, maybe unfavorable decision, but the right decision in a situation. Well, and I'll tell you the the and, and I, I do I do want to remind everybody that we're being brought to you today by our dear friends at Keyhose. They're down there in Dotham, Alabama, where they have one of the largest hose manufacturing facilities in America. And you're always welcome to visit them. Dotham, Alabama is an amazing city. Larry Williams is another guy who always brags about his EMS people. Larry Williams. Now, if I've mentioned your chief during this broadcast, be sure to let him know that Halton called you out. Yeah. So, Bobby, as we talk about, I know, I know uh, Bill wanted to go down a path of like hose line leadership. But, you know, I, I think to your point, when we talk about leadership, and I know you were, you're, you know, obviously you, my eyes are some of that, but like the stoicism, I love the whole stoic uh, philosophy. And one of the ones I quote, I always use for a lot of like my battalion chiefs who are fantastic leaders and our captains, lieutenants is uh, from Plutarch. Like a leader does anything, not everything. And like, you know, that, that's so important. And I think as people get to that leadership role is realizing as you get higher, higher up in the ranks, that the more it's cerebral and less of the tactical things and how difficult it is for you to move from that structure and direction aspect and more to the support and development and how you kind of just flow up and down that, that spiral of which, which one you do. And, and, and I think, yeah, have you ever read uh, Dandruff Malone's book, the small unit leadership? Oh, I mean, just really good. And it hit me years ago when someone gave it to me when I was a Lieutenant of, Hey, match your behavior to the person you're leading. You know, you might have to be the warden, you might have to be the coach. Each one, it might be the father figure. And the ability to, to be adaptable and resilient as a leader is so important. Well, and, and to kind of dovetail into what Bill was talking about, leadership from the conceptual to the, to the applied, right, is, is, is really important. And, and when we're talking about, you want to talk about hose line leadership, Mm -hmm. Your point's exactly spot on. Dandridge, Dandridge, Dandridge Malone's book, Small Unit Leadership, is kind of the Army's Bible because mm -hmm. that, that's where he did his work. And the Army is composed of thousands of small units. And 
the the sergeant or the corporal, whoever's le leading that group of men and women that day, is the leader by default by rank. But within that group, just like just like one of our crews, you might have a a lieutenant or a captain on a, a handline crew. But within that group, you've got people that have various levels of expertise and people who need various levels of experience in order to become more disciplined, more capable, you know, at handline movement or whatever evolution you're involved in. So I think that when we talk about leadership in those roles, there's times when you might take a less experienced person and put them on the nozzle, or you might ask them to uh, help do a more complicated layout. Say you're doing a, a center core uh, stairwell, and you're coming off a standpipe floor below, and you, you, you know, if, and I'm not saying when time matters, I'm, I'm talking about when you're, you know, when you maybe, maybe you're the third doer, you're whatever. There's times when you, a good leader will drop back and let people make decisions, see how they do. And a good leader will pick up the slack, occasionally drop back and be the guy, maybe carrying, you know, two shoulder loads or carrying a bundle and, and letting the other person have, have that head over the shoulder or be on the knob. So it's kind of a, the, the le leadership in the, in, in the application of leadership in that time frame is really interesting. And, and when Bill threw in the concept of discipline as well, a disciplined crew is a crew, you know, people are more disciplined, they think about beatings. Yes. <laughs> We're yeah. not talking about beatings. We're talking about a disciplined crew. And, and a disciplined crew is really a crew that has hit a level. And, and, and it, 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 as with anything, relationships matter. So mm -hmm. if you barely know one another, it's very difficult to say it's a, in no disrespect, they may have good discipline within the crew, but a truly disciplined crew that knows one another can be able to do things when they need to be, you put the person who's best at it in front when seconds count, like, um, you know, to, uh, to um, Kirk's point these days where, where our friends are visiting, you know, people before water, that's his new mantra. And if you have a rescue, um, obvious rescue that you've got to put people before a, the life-saving water that we bring, that's an interesting time. That's when you want to put your most experienced guy, whether it's Dan or Bill or, you know, whoever mm -hmm. at the point making the decisions. When, when you have some discretionary time, say a structure that you know is empty, verified primary search, then you can put people into positions where they gain some experience in the real world, gain that discipline so that at some point when they do have to take that lead role, they've got, they've got some base level core experience. And I think that's part of the whole application of leadership. If, um, if that makes sense, I don't know if that made a whole lot of sense. It absolutely does. And I think the, the, your, your key point is like they recognize the situation. But, you know, I think where some people miss that mark uh, or, you know, there's a deficit, which leads to more and more people putting in that want to teach leadership and attend leadership, is that, you know, they don't, re they perhaps don't realize that that doesn't occur on the fire ground. It, it occurs much further be before that. The way you train them, uh, what your doctrine is, how you hold them accountable. And I, and I come back to that every single time. Like every situation we kind of look at where we see a failure, whether it's on a hose line, it's a fire ground operation, it's instant command. The roots of that go back to training. The roots go back to how do they prepare themselves for it? And I always come back to that, that, that trifecta for our success, right? Do you have good doctrine? Not meaning that a manual or SOP or SOG is going to fight your fire. But usually those are, I know for us, for our agency, it's a collection of experiences. Things we've learned from other departments, things we learned from our own experiences, and we put it into a doctrine that says, here is the blueprint for success on the fire ground. If you're devoid of common sense, you could read this and probably have a high level of success. But so, you know, you have that doctrine first, and then you have to train people to it. So not only do you indoctrinate them to the, to the document and your doctrine and what you follow, but you socialize them to it. You, you explain the why. Why do we do this? And that opens the opportunity, another leadership trait of humility, right? Hey, what we've always done, and you talked about before with UL, uh, you know, we always want to fight this. Oh, my God, this is the flow path is ridiculous. Open up James Braidwood's book from 1830, where he tell you not to take the windows or door because the fire might get bigger in relation to the air. So making sure we're training our people appropriately. And James, match that James, called them, James called them air tracks. Yeah. And, and our, the, one of the quotes, if I get it right, he said, it's been noted on occasion of an event 
that oftentimes a building with certain doors or windows having been shut or left open, allow the air to tracks to travel unimpeded, bringing with it elements of the fire so that a fire may articulate from a first floor to a third floor. And thereby, you know, and you're like, you're reading it and you can just hear this guy, right? Oh, God, yeah. You can just hear this guy. London That's fire so in, the, in the 1800s. And, 1830. And, 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 and it, it, we could publish that in Fire Engineering tomorrow and yeah. people would go, yeah, okay. I, I, I read it like six, seven months ago because I was doing something for fire stream management. And, you know, I think it's called what, Modern, Modern Fire Engines and something else. I can't remember the, the title. He's got, quite, he's got quite a few writings. But, you know, that that section and like this is so it's the same exact thing man everything's cyclical right. but, so, but we but we did it better because we spent 10 million dollars doing it exactly so, so obviously yeah, as americans we, we got it better so yeah but you yeah. had a horse we got a 1.2 million engine company that's, take that's, that braidwood <laughs> there you go buddy you could you could get better but you couldn't pay more that's right. So that's a, I will that, up your horse. That's our. So so back to the the, the you know we were, we were talking about the, uh, the the leadership angle and 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 the discipline angle, and and I think when we talk about especially handline management and engine company work, which is where we're kind of focusing on here, at, at Bill's request, just to keep it going, I, I think it starts when you when you come in on shift, right, and um, you know. We all have experienced it in different companies and different places, but for most for most of us, when we roll in, oh, it, it, generally where I was was 0600 or 0700, mm -hmm. depending on the crew. But we roll in at 0700, and the other crew would still be there. And the first thing you did was you brought your personal gear, your your, your bunker gear, out to the rig, and you began your rig check. That's the first thing you did. Now you may have a cup of coffee with you brought from home, or you might grab one, bring a, coffee, a cup of coffee out to the rig, but it was always the rig check. And you know, you do your first walk around and make sure you know the wheels are all inflated, the, all the basic stuff is there. There's no gigantic Water. things or dangs, or, right? Nothing. Yeah, there's no, it didn't hit anything during the night that nobody noticed. And then you start getting down to depending. Well, I, I think it, you know, it's and this is where the discipline start becomes. The discipline part of it becomes, and I think the leadership part of it is becoming. I think, irrespective of your rank, you should always approach that rig as the firefighter, as the most important person on that rig, who is the firefighter. And you ought to go from the front to the back or the back to the front, check every compartment, check every tool, check the water level. And, and it's nice when you see the little, you know, the little bubble gauge thing on the side. But an old guy once told me, he said, son, you better climb up and look down in there and make sure that the that, that bubble gauge isn't, you know, frozen in time for some reason. Or, you know what I mean? Yeah, because the guys have had a hose line screaming for water. You can't go, look, the gauge says you have water. I don't know. I don't know what the problem is. But do you really? Right. And it was interesting because he told me about it. I, now, I wasn't there. But some other guys told me um, back in Albuquerque many, many years ago. I can't remember who told me. But their gauge was like reading three quarters full. Tank was empty. Tank, tank was empty. And, and I can't remember who told me that. My buddy Ted Neal will call me in an hour from now and say, it was engine 22. And they were, you know, and he'll know exactly because he's got a mind like a steel trap just welded shut. And, and I'm just kidding. But no, he'll remember. But true story, right? So, and when you learn those things and, and who you learn them from, we talk about leadership. Mm -hmm. that doesn't some of it comes from the academy and god bless the guys in the academy they, they did a great job with the folks that i went through and you, you usually learn it from an older cat or a senior cat on the rig i did you know and mm -hmm. he would come over and be more than willing to take you through the rig nice and slow and even if you rolled out we used to call it uh, um, uh, floating that was the term in my organization called floating you roll out to a different house yeah, you could always find a senior guy who knew that rig. It was his rig, you, you know, can see or, or her rig, and they would say, "Now, on this particular truck, you know," what I mean? yeah. <laughs> and you'd be like, yeah. "Okay," you know, and, and they and they'd school you, and yeah. and you hear yourself three years later with some you know 
kid who just rolled in going, now on this particular yeah. truck. Like he normally you know, doesn't talk like that. Why is he talking like that now? <laughs> hey, why, is he, why is he snarling at me suddenly, you know? So, but I think that when we talk about, you know, the, the discipline and leadership and, and especially with handline, we only bring one really, one real weapon to a fire. Well, maybe two. We bring this weapon and we bring water. Yep. You know, and, and I think it was General Rommel who said, because um, Patton always said that an ounce of sweat saved a pint of blood. And uh, Rommel said, an ounce of brains will save both. <laughs> and, which I thought was, was brilliant, right? Touche. <laughs> Touche, right? So then, then I think you transition from, you've done your personal check of the rig, you, you know, you've checked your air pack, you've checked your tools, you've checked, you know, everything you need to check. If you're, if you or if, if, even if you're not the operator, you check the warning lights, you've checked basically all the stuff you needed to check or, or whatever you're allowed to. Some places won't let you, but our job would let you, you know, turn the engine on, turn the lights on just so you were satisfied that oh, yeah, your environment was okay. And then, and then you go in a roll call where I think for handline discipline and leadership, it happens like again. Oh, yeah. Look at look at the what happened the shift before or the day before. You look at the what's missing, what's not missing. You look at the call that, and if they say went on an EMS um, heart attack call and they got there first, now you know, man, I better double check that O2 cylinder. Or I better I better make sure that you know they put whatever you know the the, the laryngoscope or the or the, the stethoscope thing back in there. You know what I mean? It, it, Cause you learn. And I think that that's part of when Bill was talking about discipline, it's, it, it's that self-discipline where you, 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 you start to enculturate into yourself muscle memory, that this is what I've got to do every day. And, and what's cool about it is when you were young, you get, you know, you get TDY would out to a truck company or you get TDY would out to a squad or whatever, and you wouldn't know where to begin. You know what I mean? And there's always some good guy, like you, Dan, or, or Doug, or some, you know, there was always some good guy who was always willing to, you know, take you by the hand and say, it's like, hey, man, I've been on this truck for five years or two years. This is my truck. And yeah. Let me show you. Right? Well, and, and when we, and to your point, you know, like, Bobby, when, when I get the opportunity to talk to our ODAs, our officer development schools, and lieutenants, and, and tell them, like, look, you're, your influence, your impact is so tremendous as a small unit leader. Don't just think when you go into that chaotic environment, it is so much more before. And so when you sit at the kitchen table, that's where our lineup typically is. Um, we call it, you roll call lineup, we call it the same thing. You know, what, how do you capitalize on that opportunity? Because if you're a company officer and you can't lead lineup or roll call, how can you lead them down a smoky hallway? So if you're really nervous and you're timid, you don't know what to do when you sit there and you have 10 sets of eyes looking at you and you're like, ah, I don't know what to do. I'm just a floating lieutenant or relief lieutenant. Well, that's where you capitalize on the opportunity, right? Because we know people were either raised to your level of expectation or dropped to your level of tolerance. So if you're a company officer, small unit leader walks in and says, hey, look, I'm, I'm the new guy here today. Um, I'm usually from another company. Um, I'm going to let the informal leader kind of go over the administrative things you guys get done as the salty senior uh, firefighter. But the ask I have for you guys is, can we hit some of your first two buildings? I'd like to see where some of your setbacks are, interesting buildings we have to go to. And then, you know, and I'll tell them like, hey, man, you have a notepad with you. Write down 10 to 15 scenarios, tactical scenarios. And look at your nozzle firefighter, because the one thing I can't stand is if I get to a fire as a deputy and go, all right, hey, uh, why didn't you take your crew and you had command? Well, I don't really know his name. And because I'm relieved, I don't really know him. And I'm not really sure that his experience. You've been here for 12 hours. You don't know his name? Like, so when you sit at the kitchen table with that roll call, I'll go, all right, Bobby, you're my nozzleman. All right, uh, two in the front, three in the rear, middle unit townhouse. I'm taking a lap. Where are you taking a hose line if we have a fire in the basement? And so you just start a conversation. And invariably what's going to happen is you're going to be there for an hour. And you're going to be talking tactics. And you're going to be training. And you're going to be sharing experience. And you're going to take all your knowledge and you're infusing it into that person. And now you know what their level of expectation, because if he says, I'm taking it to the attic, you're like, all right, Bobby, you're not the nozzleman today. Uh, you're the backup. We're going to switch. Uh, because now you have this opportunity well before you ever get to the fire to demonstrate the hose on leadership to say, okay, here's my expectation because maybe the other, your other boss who's here all the time never talks about this. 
He wants to talk about administrative items or complain about them and what they are doing to him in the fire service. But yeah. you, I have the opportunity to say, hey, here's my expectation. Here's what we're going to talk about. Here's what we're going to train on. And I'm here to help you do that. And that can, and that can lead to a company drill. That can lead to, yeah. you know, when you go through that, when you, when you pull out the, the, the run book from the previous shift, and I still like the old, you know, I, still, oh, yeah. I love the computers. Glad we do them. If you, get the print out, if you get the print out, good for you. But, the, but there's nothing like the old, you know, ours were red. And yeah. so, you know, you had the old red book and, and it even had like, you know how your Bible has the cloth? Oh, yeah. It, 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 cl- it has the cloth down the middle. Yeah, so it's you like you have an altar boy come and open it for you. <laughs> right. So you open it. Right. And and uh, I just so so before I get to Guy Fleck just sent in a great comment. That I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring up. And if you got something to say, you know, put it up on there on Facebook and Pete's watching Facebook and he'll be happy to. Uh, uh, put up your thoughts for, for us so we can t- talk to you. We'd love to. And I'll, Guy Fleck just sent us a great note. But um, so, you know, the, the other thing when you're doing that, you, the runs, you can say, hey, yeah, they had the run on uh, Candelaria. Uh, and, and you can look at the crew and say, yeah, uh, you know, 2,700 block of Candelaria. And then people go, you, go, you know where that's at? You know, wh- which way out of the house would you go to get to Candelaria? And it, is that Candelaria Avenue? Or is that Candelaria Street? And mm-hmm. then is Candelaria in, Al- in Albuquerque, Candelaria, its name changed at like the, at this highway. Like it hit this highway and it turned into Paseo del Norte rather than <laughs> Candelaria, and, and which is fascinating, right? And you know who grew up on Candelaria at, uh, Road in Albuquerque, New Mexico? No. Nah. Jim Morrison from the wow. Brothers. How wow. cool is that, huh? That's the street Jim Morrison grew up on, right? So yeah. you just uh, talk about, wow, right? I never saw that guy, but what a... So Guy sent in this note, Guy Fleck. And thank you, Guy. We really appreciate it. He wrote, Bob spoke the truth. In a call over 20 years ago, my pump gauges froze due to below temperatures uh, uh, on, on the drive to a structure fire. So as the pump operator, I had to be comfortable with my pump sounds to how much pressure I was delivering to the nozzle. That's... I... I never, that's, yeah, right. that's cool. That yeah. never happened to me. I've, I've never heard of it before. You're how, in Albuquerque. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, Albuquerque, we didn't have that a lot. We didn't have the big freeze problem. Yeah. Uh, but, but where Guy is, and Guy, I don't, I don't know where you work, Guy, uh, so I, I appreciate your note, but obviously Guy worked somewhere where it got cold enough to freeze the pump gauge. And yep. wow, that is, yeah, I, I never, so there's a great drill, right? Like, could you block out some of your gauges? And, and what was cool, what's cool about Guy's comment here, he could hear his pump. Yeah, using all your senses, right? I mean, like, that is, like, cool beyond, I mean, right? And so, Talk about know, a drill. And, and you talk about, um, we were talking about EMS to start us off, like how, how much we run EMS. And we all do, right? I mean, it's 70%, 80% of what we do. So routinely, one of the drills we would do to kind of, Again, drive the expectation of the engine company for hose line leadership. You run a medical local. We go there often. We're there all the time. Everyone walks in. In our engine companies, we have four. All four of us walk in, four of us walk out. We help them put the person in the back of the ambulance, and we go back and service. So we get about a block away. Guys all have their headsets on, and I'll say to the right bucket, hey, give me an on-scene report for that house we were just at. Uh, I look at the state of the left bucket guy. Where's uh, the... the, the um, the door to the basement steps. Where was it? Uh, where were the bedrooms? And so, you know, I started seeing, because they were waiting for this question, that every time we walk into a medical local, they'd be <laughs> looking around because they're waiting for me to ask a question. Now, it might be 10, 12, 15, 25 calls later, three o'clock in the morning, I ask them a question. But when you know they would ask why is because I want you to know that all these houses probably look similar, whether it's an old neighborhood or a new cookie cutter neighborhood. So when we come here at three o'clock in the morning for her basement on fire, and we're, we only have one option, which is go down the stairs, we're not wasting time. You know, to hit the right hand wall, you're going to run into a kitchen table, make the turn in the kitchen. There's going to be a, ba- a basement uh, stairs door right there. Make the push. So capitalizing on every single call we run as an opportunity to hone our skill and develop our mastery, because that's what we're looking to do, right? Right. And, and to your point, so you could take it even a little further, like, and, and I think to combine it with what Brian Brush and Anthony Castros, Raul Angelo, uh, Kirk Isaacson, we have this huge debate going on right now about 
rescue, which is a great, great conversation to be having, right? And Brian, Brian's study kind of showed that we're rescuing a lot more people than we give ourselves credit for. Of course, and, we never give ourselves and, credit, and, right? I love it that we're now hearing people say, expect fire, expect victims, right? And we roll in and we've got a RIT team. And I was like, this is a true story. So I'm laying in bed last night and I'm thinking, why don't we have, you know, rapid rescue teams for the civilians too? I mean, you know, we, we, we have a crew outside now codified in our systems for, for rapid intervention for us, mm -hmm. right? Well, we didn't come to the fire for us. We came no. to the fire for the folks inside the fire. So, you know, why don't we have that rapid team ready? Uh, and then and, and a great question for our guys are, hey, you, you get you get that patient out of the car or you get that patient like you know, Mark Gregory's guys with Man and Machine, you get that limb out of the out of the sausage grinder or whatever, you better know how to stop that bleeding. You better know how to, you know what I mean? Control that. Or, or all you've done now is, you know, you know, help the guy bleed out. And so that can be the next part of it. Okay. Where, where do you put the tourniquet or how do you apply pressure or how do you do a pressure dressing or, you know, how do you put on that? Um, now we've got the, the, the liquid, uh, the liquid clotting uh, stuff folks can use and stuff. I've never used it, but you know, I, I've heard about it. And, and so, yeah, it's out there. Right. And, 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 and I think it's like, we're, we're talking about handline discipline. And we're talking about hose discipline. And again, a real quick shout out to our friends at Keith. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for supporting us. We, we couldn't do these hump day hangouts without the great people from Key Hose. And Key Hose, Dotham, Alabama, one of my favorite places in the whole world. Uh, you really wanna go there. It's the, Larry Williams and the guys and gals on the Dotham Fire Department are some of the coolest cats you're ever gonna wanna meet. They'll be happy to take you out. They use Key Hose. And uh, they'd be happy to take you out and show you Dotham and you can ride out and just a, just super, super people, you know, tell, tell them, tell them Dan Shaw sent you, don't <laughs> tell them my name, they won't let you in, tell, you them Dan Shaw, tell them Dan Shaw sent you and, and go down and go down and, and visit our friends at Key and, or even go, go to the website or visit them at FDIC and tell them how much you appreciate what they do for you. Cause these are important conversations. And we apologize. We have a bunch of technical difficulties. Some of our friends are down helping Kurt with his show in Pensacola. So they had technical difficulties at the hotel and they couldn't get on today. So to all our friends down there in Pensacola, we hope you're having a great time. So, and God bless you. Keep, keep going guys. So uh, that, the, you know, our engine crews and our truck crews, but, you know, really we need to be thinking about patient care inside of that. Right. Like, you know, it's one thing to get the person out, but don't always count on having a, a medic unit or enough medic units there to handle a situation, right? Because on a lot of fire runs, you might go and maybe there's one medic unit or two medic units, but imagine uh, the guys, the guys and gals in Buffalo yesterday, five people, five. You, you better know what you're doing because if you're really telling people, you know, expect fire, expect victims, expect to be responsible for doing something for them too. Not yeah. just getting them out, you know, getting them. My, my, Can't lay them in the front yard and walk away. My great grandfather once said, the only reason for a man to go into a burning building was to get another man out to save his life. And back then it was, you know, it, 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 it was old, you know, it was all men. So no, you didn't mean, so today just say to get a person out, right? The only yeah. reason for a person to go in is to get another person out. We can, we can burn down every building in the city and rebuild them better. Um, but you can't rebuild any, every single human being is uniquely precious. Every single one. There's not a single human being on the face of the planet that you can replace, period, period. And unlike Mao, the crazy lunatic communist socialist bastard that he was, he once said that it doesn't matter how many we kill because we've got plenty of people. Yep. So, so the next time you're voting for a socialist, just keep that in the back of your mind. <laughs> Good, good. No, I was just about the World Economic, the World Economic Council was on there saying they want to depopulate the world. That's a pack of who wacky if I ever heard it. So, so while you yeah. talk about population, <laughs> lead into you know uh, functional staffing, right? So you know companies always struggle with functional staffing that term, and, and Doug and I will bring it up in class all the time. Yeah, I don't have the staffing for it. No, I get it, man. You know, I know a lot of places aren't as privileged as I am or as Doug is in the FDNY, but how we look at functional staffing is functional staffing is about identifying the roles and responsibilities that every person that would ride on that rig, whether they're there or they're going to show up later. Eventually, you're going to at least get two or three people on a hose line. May not show up with it. 
So when companies sit in a firehouse, like, hey, I, and which should never, ever be uttered in any firehouse is, I don't know what to train on today. You know, the fire always gets a vote. And it, 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 as soon as we can understand that mentality, we'll grasp that, oh my God, there's always something I can train on. So when we looked at functional staffing in the aspect to say, okay, um, for me, the right bucket position was always a nozzle firefighter. So what does that mean? You know, the, the hose line leadership is, I need you to know how to do a nozzle inspection. I need you to know what the turbine teeth do. I need you to know fire stream management. Why do we take an inch three quarter versus a two and a half or two and a half versus inch three quarter? Because of the little droplets of water that Andy Fredericks taught us about, you know, 60, 70, you know, or 50 years later with his article. It's just fantastic. Um, and then you think about- It's only, you know, it's only 30. Don't age us that Oh, well, no. His article was about 50 years later, little drops of water. That's He's not true. that old. He wrote it 50 years later after, yes. after, after Lloyd. Now yes. Andy is 30 years later. So yeah, like, is it so 30 years? 80 years. Good Lord. But, you know, each one of those, when you say, hey, I, here's my position here. This is the nozzle firefighter. This is the backup firefighter. And here's the list of the skills that I need you to develop. And each one of those is a drill. So if I'm the nozzle firefighter, I learn how to estimate the stretch. And that may be a five minute drill, but I guarantee it'll probably be an hour long conversation doing some pulling hose lines, trying to figure out that parking spots are 10 feet apart. And so when you pull up the, the garden apartment, the, the guy who's a nozzle firefighter is like, all right, six cars, 60 feet. I know I can use a well hole. I know the apartment because I've been there for medical locals is 20 feet deep. Hey, hey, Cap, 250 to the front door. Yep, good. Because you've so trained. Take it, take it a little further. What's that main on Candelaria? Yeah. What, what do you got? You got you got an eight inch, four inch residential, eight inch residential, 12 inch. You got a 40. Is it a 48? Can you can you do a you know, can that strip mall or do you have to go over two blocks, maybe to Adams Street or up to whatever it is in Washington and pull we, in a, we pull in a big 700,000 square feet on fire? That was huge for us. You know, eight inch main, 36 inch main. Yeah, big difference. <laughs> Because water is a non-compressible substance, right? Yeah. <laughs> so only so much can go through that. So you could squeeze it all you want. <laughs> squeeze it all you want. Sque yeah, right. And, and so I love I love where the conversation's going. And I think that, you know, as, as we talk about, you said the, the, the guy has to know how to clean the nozzle. He has to know how to set it. He has to troubleshoot hose. Make sure the layout's right. He has to know how to take it off and lay it out correctly. Ray does a wonderful job. Ray used to do a great class on uh, stretching off of different you know, hose bed configurations and, mm -hmm. and, and showing people how to get the line, you know, in line with where you're trying to go, which sometimes is counterintuitive, right? You, you know, and, and Ray did a great job. That was a great class. If you ever get a chance to bring Ray in, ask him to do his hand line class, because, you know, sometimes we get stuck in the prison of two ideas. And, and you were talking about Lloyd Lehman, you're talking about Andy. One of the things that Andy had for Lloyd Lehman was a tremendous amount of respect. But he also knew that a lot of what Lloyd wrote was very, very true at the time. Some of it still was true, but mm -hmm. some of it needed revision. So when we talk about Andy and Lloyd, don't think for one moment that Andy was dismissive or saying, throw everything out. What he was saying was, now we have a new problem with this superheated smoke and fire spread being greatly accelerated from, was it, from what it was when Lloyd wrote. And also remember Lloyd had shipboard firefighting where we, he had really tightly contained fires, which is part of what we're trying to recreate now with this whole close before you, you know, close before you doze or you know, shut the door before you snooze or whatever the hell the <laughs> saying's supposed to be. But you know what I mean? We're, yeah. we're, trying, to get, we're trying to get back to some, some level of compartmentalization, which was really the key of construction feature Prior to 19, probably 45, 1950, it started going to a more open, you know, span because we started building trusses. We started building ways to get longer expanses to where you could, you could, you know, we started geometry to quote Frank Brannigan replaced mass. So yes. geometry and construction replaced mass. It used to be massive timber. And then when we figured out, you know, the geometry of, of trusses and, 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 and just geometry, we were able to replace mass with that with that engineering so you know andy although he wrote about you know because the prevailing the prevailing modality in that day was you know to go in and 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 try to you know wait till you wait till you could see 
the fire, right? And Andy said, oh no, no. If you're looking at it, you're way too far in. <laughs> you're yeah. in too much trouble, you know, because yeah. you've got you're all this potential fuel, fuel above your head, right? So he he was just a genius. And, and so was Lloyd. I mean, they're both, they're both books you should read. Don't get stuck in the prison of two ideas like, well, the, the smooth bore is the only tip you should well, read. You, yeah. you better know how to use every tip you possibly can, because trust me, you sometimes the fire doesn't like this tip or sometimes you need this tip. So you, you ought to, a, a good, good disciplined crew doesn't get thrown by the fact that it's not their favorite go-to tip on the end. You know, they take the, they take the right tool in for the right fire. You know, there's a, yeah. a, 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 any guy, I love working on my cars, but I, I have more than one wrench. Ask my wife. Yeah. Well, and you hit two two key points there, right? When you talk about Lloyd, you talk about Andy, you talk about what Bill's doing and Kurt's doing down in Pensacola. Um, one is you adapt to your environment. You have the ability to recognize the fundamental things that James Braidwood talked about, that uh, Lloyd talked about, that uh, Andy talked about, and now you adapt it to your current environment. And I never understood this sandpaper culture that exists that like, you must choose experience or science. That's the dumbest damn thing I've ever heard. Like, why would you ever discount your experience? And why would you ever discount the scientific experiment you go to called a fire? But the other part of that, I think that's really important and that really resonates with me is I never met Andy, but I can tell you um, every time I, when I was an engine officer, I had a new probie come in, they got that article. They got a book of all of Andy's articles. Everything I read about Fire well, Street. The real authorized book authorized by his widow is being published right now by Fire Engineering. Which is fantastic. And I, I encourage so anybody who downloaded it. the unauthorized, bootlegged, stolen material should do the right thing and buy the book from his wife and children so that they get absolutely your, your buckaroos. And so, yeah, no, and that, I 100% agree, and they absolutely should because. You know, that was a person, again, never met him, tremendous impact on me in my career as an engine officer. And even to this day, as a deputy, I still refer when I go back and I, so I do station inspections, right? It's one of my you know, tasks in my job. So quick, I show Andy, up, quick Andy story. We're doing the yeah, secret right. nozzle, we're doing the secret nozzle test. Again, hand lines and nozzles, doing the secret nozzle test out at uh, the rock at, with Chief Pete Gancy. And so I said, hey, can I, can my, can we bring, he said, well, we need this guy down there. We need that guy down there. And he, he brought down all the battalion chiefs and all the chiefs in the New York City Fire Department to work with this Vindicator nozzle. It was called the secret nozzle. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. At, at, the, at this, uh, it, for, for a couple of weeks, but they all rotated in and messed around with this thing. And uh, so I said, I, I need my buddy Andy to come down here. And he goes, well, what's he doing? I said, well, he's a, at the time, he was a firefighter. And, uh, he, and it was, this was, jeez, um, a couple of months before 9-11, the first time we asked, that, asked him to bring Andy down. And he goes, fire, fire. Just fire. I said, yeah, yeah. He said, you'll love this guy. So he comes down and Andy's messing around. We're doing stuff. And Pete walks over to me. And Pete was always smoking. And he goes, that's a smart kid. And he just walked by. And, and, and I told Andy and Andy's buttons were coming off. I mean, oh, yeah, I'm sure he's beaming. Pete, Pete, for Pete Gancy to call you a smart guy, you had to be a smart guy. Yeah. There, you, he was not a man who suffered fools lightly. And, and he... There was nobody more connected. The, the men and women of that organization and some of this collective memory, the guys, the older guys will back me up on it. You know, people like Al Turi and, and Pete Gansey, they, they, loved, they loved their department. They loved their people on that department. They loved their city and they cared for one another. And Pete was the first chief to get tenure in like 20 years. And he was a civil service chief. So if he had survived 9-11, he'd probably still be chief today mm. of department. Now, right now, the great, one of the greatest men in the world, Tommy Richardson, is in that position. And you couldn't, you know, in the hierarchy of fire worlds, Tommy's at the top of that tree. Um, so, and there's another guy who I've heard he brags about his EMS people. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, God bless him. But to, to your point, you know, read everything you can and, 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 it's just like, you know, Ray just, uh, Ray was on a couple of weeks ago talking about the New York City um, engine company manual manual. that he just completed, right? He just completed working on it. Now, I'm in Limestone, Oklahoma, volunteer job. We, we got a few paid guys that, but 90% but volunteer job, 80% volunteer job. Now, 
the chance of us ever having the manning that the, the guys and gals do in New York City are freaking zero, yeah. at least for the foreseeable future. But we can still learn from that manual. Yes. You know what I mean? We can still learn by having Ray or, or you or Bill or, you know, uh, Aaron or Kurt or whoever come down and talk about putting out fires. You know what I mean? You can, and, and you can also learn, believe it or not, from the kid who just came out of the academy. The, yep. kid, with, the kid with two days on the job Everyone's might got pick something up in the academy that's brand new that you missed or might not know about the job doing, or he might just be that insightful. You know what I mean? He might yeah. be the next Tommy Brennan. He might be the next whoever, right? Someone's going to be. Pardon? Someone's going to be in that role. And why not start capitalizing? Because you look, I, mean, I, I think you know this too. The day I retire, they're not going to you know, put a black bunny and mourn me for 12 days and shut down the fire department. They're going to fill my spot and you keep on stepping. And, I, and that's why I mentioned Andy and you know the impact because that's what it's all about is impact, right? And a wise man once told me, like, you want to make change? Right. Yeah. It's so true. Like, you take John, your mind, John you take Norman, your perfect example. John Norman. You're right. John Norman wrote his first article for firehouse magazine for my buddy harvey while he was still on probation wow. and boy did he catch flack right oh, sure but he's you know today he's john norman right but you know, the great thing is is you know i have the, the honor and privilege i'm of talking about senior not captain john norman jr no 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 I, he's I, also a giant in his own right so to sit there at the fire engineering uh dinner they have for all the authors at fdic which is fantastic you know, here I, I reminisce to, I read Salka's articles. I had to study John Norman's book to get promoted lieutenant. And now I sit and have a drink or break bread with these guys. And they're just normal people who are passionate about the job. They're passionate about sharing their knowledge. So one of our listeners, I guarantee several of our listeners could be those next people who are doing it. And it comes back to that leadership aspect. And what impact do you want to leave? So one, one last right quick story. I'm, I'm in, uh, I'm in uh, Colorado Springs, Colorado last weekend, giving a little talk. And um, I'm hanging out some of the greatest guys and gals anywhere. And this young guy comes walking up to me. I'm trying to think, T Taylor, Tyler, Tyler, paramedic, got his shirt, da, 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 and he's talking about all the jobs he's worked on. He's been in a couple of different departments and how happy he is that he's where he is now. And I'm trying to think of security, security, Colorado was uh, the department he was with. There were guys from Fort Carson. Um, uh, a couple of different jobs were there. What amazing people. And, and, and one of the most insightful guys, brief conversation with him, but he was absolutely brilliant. And then there was another guy, just one guy after another was just more and more impressive. And then this captain gets this award for what's called the Master Firefighter Program. And so what they did was, that the uh, Sean Biddle, who's the chief out there now, got with a couple of guys and said, I want to take the, the firefighter position and I want to create a master firefighter program. So they created four levels, right? Like you graduate firefighter one or two, then you go to level two, level three. Like an apprenticeship. And was, right. And it was cool because they did it in reverse, right? So when you're a when you're a master firefighter, you're a class one. Then you're a class when you're so you're a class, you're a class two in your third year or third level. So just like in the military academies where it's, mm -hmm. it's reversed, right? So, which was really cool also, but they put, they put together this amazing program and, and this captain came up and the, Sean came from, from St. Louis. That, that's where he worked before he went out there. And so he brought in this guy, local, more local guy who knew all the wildland stuff because it's freaking Colorado Springs, right? Yeah. They, they got land and- Just a little bit just the coolest program. And I'm sitting there going, you guys got to write this up. You got to teach this. And they're like, really? People would be interested in this. And I'm like, yeah, we'd be yes. that interested in it. It's like, great. And then I met this crew from Fort Carson, these three incredible young people who were like just rock solid firefighters. It was like, man, leadership isn't about giving orders or, telling people what to do leadership's about helping people be the best they can be and 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 be in there for them and and letting them know how amazing they are and can be you know what i mean yeah and i was just every other person i talked to there was just i was just blown away it was like and and, and every time you go out i don't care where you go 
It's that way. Yep. It's that way in this job. No, it always is. And, and when I hear people say like, oh my God, this generation, man, it, this generation's fine. I see some, you know, it's just like the bell curve. I know when I walked in the door, like, oh, your generation's lazy. Fires are all gone. Doug talks about his father when he walked into the firehouse. He said, oh, your generation's lazy. There's no more fires. You'll, you'll, you guys wouldn't make a pimple on a good firefighter's ass. Why would I want to be a pimple on one of those? I used to think there was like graveyards full of guys with pimply butts. You know? <laughs> why, why would you think I want to be a pimple on some guy's backside? <laughs> but it's always, every generation has looked on the next generation a little askance. Yeah. But, but, but I found that that's mostly a phenomenon between the ages of like 30 and 45 or so. After 45, you're kind of like, no, nah, these guys are amazing. And, yeah. and gals, you want to really get a great example of that? Go out to any aircraft carrier in America and watch those 19 and 20 year old men and women launch and fly those jets. 19 years old. Yeah, 19, 20, 20, 23, 24, 25. Now the pilot's probably 23. Yeah. You know, the kid launches 19, 18. Yeah. And, and they are the most squared away people on the face of the freaking planet. Go down, go, yeah. go down to any. You know, go, go down to any fire academy, spend 15 minutes with the men and women in, in those classes, and you'll walk away saying, holy moly, their yep. music sucks, but they're good people. <laughs> I don't understand what they wear. I don't like their music, but I, I, yeah, the fire I'm service not sure is what okay. the nose thing is. You yeah. know, spike through the nose, but what a great guy. No, you know, no. Wow. It, it, again, I mean, it's, it, you know, that, that's, it, you, you kind of alluded to it, right? I mean, rank just gives you the ability to enforce policy. Leadership can be anywhere. It can be any rank, it can be any person. It can be informal, it can be formal. But it's so important that we understand that it's all about the impact. It's about the impact you're going to have on others, the impact you're going to have on the fire service. And that's a tremendous opportunity and privilege that we can't squander. And, and I think that all of us, I'll, I'll close with this final thought. And, 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 and again, thank you to our friends at Kehoe's for helping us do this. Please go to keyhose.com. They're absolutely wonderful people. Their products are fantastic. Please let them know how much you appreciate it. We apologize. Our friends are, are, are down in Pensacola helping Kurt at Kurt's show. And uh, I, I think it's the Water on the Fire show um, yeah, the, that's going on right eight, now. So wonderful, wonderful, wonderful event. Great friends of ours. And so we apologize. They had some technical difficulties um, so and couldn't be with us. But I'll leave you with this final thought. It was George Washington, who to me is probably one of the, one of the people I, him and Jimmy Stewart, the top of my list for people that I hold in high regard um, for, for different reasons, but for many of the same reasons. But Washington once said that he owed all of his intellectual, spiritual, and physical uh, training and strength. No, all of it, he, what he said was he owed all that he was to the physical, emotional, and intellectual training that he got from his mom. He got from his mom. His dad died when he was very young. So his mom basically raised him and, and, uh, and they had a contentious relationship, but that didn't stop Washington from being grateful for what his mom did for him. And I think being grateful is the beginning of all leadership. I'm, I'm grateful for all the men and women, my mom and dad, and all the people who helped me become a man. And, and I think that that makes me grateful to be able to know the young people that I get to meet. And, and hopefully, I, I think that gratitude for the gifts we've been given, life, this incredible job, freedom, um, that's, that's the beginning. I think wisdom, wisdom begins with the fear of God. And I think the ability to help others begins with gratitude for what you've been given. And that's where I would leave it on a talk. And even when it comes to, you know, hand lines and, and crew discipline and understanding, you know, what to do at different situations with the, the hose line, just being grateful for the great instructors you've had, the great companies like Key Hose, um, the people who are willing to take the time to help you. And, and we've got a lot of classes at FDIC that you can come and make me grateful for you spending your money at FDIC. I'm just kidding. <laughs> But, but, but we'd love to see it at FDIC and, and listen to the Bill Gustins and the Dan Shaws and, and the Doug Mitchells and the uh, Dave Pages and, and the Frank Viscusos, who all five of those men that I just mentioned 
are working so hard to be on that main stage for you on Wednesday and Thursday that you'll be so impressed with every single one of them. If you don't know who Dave Page is, if you don't know who Doug Mitchell is, if you don't know who Frank Viscuso is, and you don't know who Dan Shaw is, please come and have something else to be grateful for. So Dan, why don't you take us out? Uh, I think you hit it, man. And, and when we talk about leadership, it's about motivation. And I don't think there's a greater motivator than gratitude. Uh, the, the ability to demonstrate it, show it, and have it every single day is, uh, as Colin Powell said, like, you know, perpetual optimism is a force multiplier. So, so is gratitude. Coming into this, this, this job, this profession, and recognizing that all that other people have invested in, in it and also in you to get you to this point. Now you have that responsibility and that privilege to carry it forward. And there's really no greater opportunity and no greater privilege than when you get to do that. And especially whether it's a hose line leadership, leading at the kitchen table or leading an organization or just leading the person who's sitting next to you to be a good leader. So, so you said it well yourself, Bobby. Well, thank you all for joining with us today. We're sorry for the late start. We're sorry our rest of our crew couldn't be with us. Technical difficulties happen as, as we all know. And, uh, Dan, I can't wait to see you uh, Wednesday. Uh, Opening open it up, and um, it's just going to be a absolute joy to share the stage with you, man. And uh, yeah, it is. I hope I'm opening for you. I'm warming up for you. <laughs> no, I'm first. You're second. Oh, man, I'm, no pressure I'm just, there. I'm just, I'm just, the, I'm just the warm up back. Yeah, I want to be the warm up back. You're, no, you're the, you're, no, you're the headliner. No, yeah, my name's the small name on the marquee. It's the Shaw, baby. So. I love you, brother. Love you all. God bless. And, and if I don't get a chance to be on again before, have a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, everyone. God bless.